In this video, I'll be having a play with the Z80 CPU. I wanted to learn and play with an 8-bit CPU, and the Z80 plays really well with breadboard. No, not that type of breadboard, this type. Another reason for choosing the Z80 is its low cost. And of course, it has been used in many retro classics, and being 8-bit hopefully makes it a little easier to understand. What do I mean when I say that it's an 8-bit CPU? Well, its data bus is 8 bits wide. That's one byte. Fun fact, half a byte is called a nibble. You couldn't make this stuff up. So what can you do with an 8-bit data bus? Well, you can either read in or output 8 bits of data at the same time. Therefore, in binary, the minimum value would be all of the data bus pins at 0, and the maximum value would be all of the data bus pins at 1. Since reading and writing numbers in binary isn't very human friendly, we like to convert binary or base 2 as it's known in mathematics, into either hexadecimal, which is base 16, or good old decimal, which is also called base 10. So as you can see, the minimum value in hex is 00, zero and the maximum value is FF, and this is a lot more human friendly, especially when coding. And in decimal, we have the minimum value of 0, and the maximum is 255. Converting between binary, hexadecimal, and decimal is not covered in this video, but maybe that's something we can look at in the future, why not let me know in the comments down below if this is a topic that you would like me to cover. It's quite usual today to see computers with 16GB of RAM, but exactly how much memory can a Z80 CPU address? This has to do with the number of address lines on its address bus. These run from A0 through to A15, so there are 16 address lines in total. 16 bits is 2 bytes, and this gives us a minimum binary value of 16 zeros and a maximum binary value of 16 ones. You can see how much harder large binary numbers are to read, and this is where hexadecimal shines. In hex, these values become 0000, zero, zero, zero and FFFF, F, F. and in decimal, that's a range of 0 through to 65535. Since we have an 8-bit data bus, there is one byte of data storage at each addressable memory location. As there are 1024 bytes per kilobyte, we just need to divide the total addressable locations by 1024 to get the total addressable memory space, which is 64 kilobytes. What's important to remember is that this value of 64 kilobytes doesn't mean that I can use 64 kilobytes of RAM with my Z80, since the machine would have some of its memory space taken up with an EEPROM and I.O. chips. Now before you all say, what about the Spectrum 128K? That had a Z80 CPU, and it had more than 64 kilobytes of RAM. Well, they achieved that with some fancy tricks, where several banks of 16 kilobytes actually shared the same address space, but that's way beyond what I'm going to look at in this video. I think it's important to get a feel of what 64 kilobytes actually looks like compared to, say, 16 gigabytes in a modern machine. And I love to visualize things like this with something that we can all relate to, and for this example, I'm going to use distance. So if we start with 64 kilobytes and imagine that that represents a one mile run, then one megabyte would be like a 16 mile drive. One gigabyte would be like flying 16,384 miles. And 16 gigabytes would take you just past the moon. I really think this illustrates the difference in size between 64 kilobytes and 16 gigabytes. So what's the simplest thing I can do with my Z80 CPU and actually see something happen? If I set it up in this configuration, I can get the Z80 to continuously execute the no-op instruction and see the green LEDs give a binary count. The CPU will execute a no-op instruction when it reads all zeros on the data bus, and no-op tells the CPU to do nothing and then move on to the next instruction. The no-op instruction takes four clock cycles to execute, and then the program counter increments by one and outputs this new value to the address bus, which is what I wired the green LEDs to. Let's take a look at how we can connect this up. Without using an EEPROM, I can tell the Z80 to execute a no-op instruction by connecting all of the data bus pins to 0 volts using some 10 kilo ohm resistors. Next, I can visually see the address that the CPU is outputting if I connect some LEDs to the address bus, and I'm going to use a 1 kilo ohm resistor as the CPU cannot source very much current. I'm also going to add an LED to the M1 pin of the CPU so I can see whenever an instruction is executed. And pins 16, 17, 24, 25 and 26 need to be tied high as they are active low. If we leave them floating, we don't know what value they'll assume and the system may not work. Now we've all the connections sorted, I just need some way of telling the CPU to actually run and read the next instruction from the data bus. This is achieved by connecting a clock signal to pin 6 of the Z80. Usually, the clock signal would be in the range of megahertz, that's millions of times per second. 
The issue I'll have using a clock speed that fast is that the LEDs will appear to my eyes to be permanently on. And you see this effect with your own household lights, where they look like they are permanently on, but are actually turning off and on between 50 and 60 times per second, depending on the country you live in. And since I'm lacking slow motion eyes, the only way I'm going to see the LEDs counting is if I slow the clock down a little. Fortunately, we can easily make a slow clock using a 555 timer. But where would the fun be in using a single chip when I could build the 555 timer out of discrete components? I made this kit which is available from slothbike.com and I'm going to use this instead of a 555 timer chip. So with the addition of a couple of resistors and a capacitor I can get a nice slow clock speed. For this video I'll select some component values to give me a clock speed of around 5 or 6 Hz so that's 5 or 6 cycles per second. For a little bonus I've included the build of this 555 kit at the end of the video. Here is the assembled circuit on breadboard. I have the 555 timer kit in an A-stable configuration and you can see the clock output on this yellow LED. The clock speed is determined by resistors R1, R2 and capacitor C1. The 555 timer outputs its clock signal on pin 3, which I've connected to pin 6 of the Z80. The first 8 resistors here are the 10 kilo ohm resistors tying the data bus pins to 0 volts so that the CPU will read all zeros, the instruction for no op. A no op instruction takes 4 clock pulses, so for every 4 clock pulses the M1 LED will flash once. The program counter is incremented by one and this new address is put out on the address bus. So here we can see the address bus incrementing its binary count by one with each M1 pulse. And that's it. Pretty much the simplest thing you can do with a Z80 without an EEPROM or IO chips. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at the setup. So on the right is the discrete 555 timer kit that's providing the clock pulse. Then we have the Z80 executing no ops. And here I'm measuring the clock with my scope and we can see it's six Hertz. I think it would be pretty cool to add an EEPROM to this and actually get the Z80 doing something, but that's way beyond what I wanted to look at in today's video. So as promised, here's the build of the Slothbite Discrete 555 timer kit. It's available in two versions and the version that I'm building here is the easy version. 